what causes scoliosis. While most people have heard of scoliosis, few people realize how prevalent scoliosis is. The current estimates is that 7 million people are living with scoliosis in the United States alone. And we know scoliosis is the leading spinal condition among school-aged children. Now, if we combine those numbers and we also imagine how we're able to gauge how many people have scoliosis and are undiagnosed and unaware of scoliosis because we believe we un that many patients or the majority of patients are undiagnosed and they don't even know they have scoliosis, this number would increase and increase significantly. So what patients are normally affected with scoliosis or who gets affected by scoliosis. Unfortunately, scoliosis affects all ages from, ba from babies to elderly and everybody in between. And scoliosis has no um, prevalence on only this age group. It can affect any age group. However, scoliosis is most commonly diagnosed in adolescent stages during growth. And this is normally between ages of 10 and 18. And this is what we call adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Now, when we look at adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, this is by far the largest diagnosis that exists. Idiopathic scoliosis can affect um, any age group, but it's normally diagnosed in adolescent. And idiopathic means not associated with a single cause. Idiopathic means that these patients are otherwise healthy, but they have scoliosis for some reason. We consider idiopathic to be a multifactorial condition, meaning they can be caused from many multiple of factors that can vary from one person to another. And in fact, somebody could have more than one factor or one variable. And it's impossible for us to predict who would develop scoliosis or not develop scoliosis because this, this is why it's called idiopathic. Now, there are other types of scoliosis outside of idiopathic scoliosis, but we know that idiopathic scoliosis is the largest group of scoliosis uh, diagnoses, and that's 80% of all known diagnosis cases. The other re remaining 20% of scoliosis are associated with known causes, and these tend to be neuromuscular scoliosis, something called degenerative scoliosis, and something called congenital scoliosis. Now, neuromuscular scoliosis is caused by a, there being a presence of a larger neuromuscular condition something like cerebral palsy, like Marfan syndrome, like spina bifida, bifida like neuromuscular dystrophy. And normally the patient will have contractures of ligaments, muscles, and tissues, or laxity of ligaments, muscles, and tissues that can lead to the development of scoliosis. But however, in most of these cases, these neuromuscular cases are treated like idiopathic cases because there are some, there are some theories in idiopathic scoliosis that a lot of patients could have a neuromuscular component associated with their scoliosis but since it's not really categorized or can't be categorized, it can't truly be diagnosed with a neuromuscular condition. Congenital scoliosis is when you're truly born with scoliosis, and this is when you're born with a malformed vertebra in the spine. And this malformed vertebra is called a hemivertebra, and it develops in utero, and you're born with this, and you can find this on the x-ray. This is, Congenital scoliosis is by far the easiest to diagnose. And then the last case I want to talk about is degenerative scoliosis. Now, degenerative scoliosis is what we find in older, children, in older adults, and this happens because something shifts in the spine, and this causes a, a, a scoliosis to develop in the adult form, and then because of the shift will cause this degen abnormal degeneration to occur in that area, will lead to a scoliosis developing in later stage life, typically 50, 60 years of age or so. Now, unfortunately, idiopathic scoliosis in the adult form as it progresses leads to degenerative changes. So we can see degenerative changes in idiopathic scoliosis and then degenerative changes in degenerative scoliosis. So what I'm trying to say is there's like, there's nowhere here it says that you can't have some variables or some factors from many different things. And in fact, we also know as curves sit there that vertebrae become wedged and to become asymmetrical like a congenital scoliosis, but they happen as a response to the scoliosis occurring. So there's overlapping variables factors when we look at all of these types of scoliosis cases. One thing we do know is that scoliosis, no matter which one you're looking at, is a progressive problem, meaning that it is its very nature to worsen over time. While we don't always don't know exactly what will trigger the onset of scoliosis, we do know that curves progress mostly during growth and development in adolescent stages. It is in this pubescent growth spurt is when we expect curves 
assume the most risk of progression. So if a curve is going to worsen quickly, it normally does it right here in this stage. In the adult stage, curves progress relatively slowly until we start getting into later stage life, plus 55 degrees or, or plus 55 years of age or so, we tend to see an increase of progression. For women, it's closer to that menopause age between 50 and 55. For men, it's between 60 and 65. But we see this progression start to occur, faster progression start to occur in later stage life. And this is a result of this compression over time. Now, the question I get asked is, okay, we, we don't know what causes scoliosis all the time. Can we cure scoliosis? So like I said, we know scoliosis is progressive because we don't know what causes the majority of scoliosis. Scoliosis is uncurable. We can't cure it because it's an idiopathic problem. However, it's highly treatable. A lot of times you get asked questions is if I knew what caused it, would it change our treatment outcome? Well, in the majority of cases, I believe even if we knew exactly what caused that, that, that person's scoliosis to develop it, to develop. By the time we normally find scoliosis and start treating it, the curve itself has become very structural. And that structural component is what we need to treat, not necessarily what caused it. And this is even true when curves are diagnosed in adolescent stages. But we do know the earlier that we diagnose it and the earlier we treat it, there's much less limitations because the curve is less structural. And the best way to, for me to explain this is to compare this to something like I like to call an earthquake. Uh, how we, if we wanted to treat a building as a result of an earthquake, we know exactly what causes an earthquake, right? The, birth, the, earth, the plates shift, the ground rumbles, the structure of the building is affected and it starts collapsing or there's damage. Well, we could realign the plates, which is what caused the structural deviation or problems in the building, but the building isn't going to rebuild itself you still would have to rebuild the building. And this is also true with scoliosis. Even if we corrected the cause, by the time we diagnose it, the curve is already structural. So we must treat the curve like a curve, just like you must treat the building that's been damaged like a damaged building, even if you corrected the cause. Another way of explaining is, let's say that the scoliosis happened as a result of some kind of malnutrition. Right? And we diagnose the curve and say it's 25 or 30 degrees. At this point, you can provide all the malnutrition to this person and the curve won't get straight on its own. You still would have to treat the curve at a structural level. So even though we don't know exactly what causes it, it doesn't mean we can't treat it effectively. And even if we knew what caused it, doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna get better results treating it because we're treating, we're treating the scoliosis as a structural component. And that's by the time we diagnose it, that's the number one thing that we need to deal with. Since scoliosis is a structural problem to effectively treat it, we must address it on a structural level. And a structural level means more than just increasing strength or muscle strength or looking at flexibility. We have to look at scoliosis on a structural level and use all the components at doing structural rehabilitation. This is normally augmented with many different types of treatment, treatments like physical therapy for scoliosis, like rehabilitation for scoliosis, like chiropractic care for scoliosis, like corrective bracing for scoliosis. And all these things are designed and, and put together and coordinated in a way to address the structure, not the symptoms of scoliosis. So here at Scoliosis Reduction Center, we like to treat scoliosis as soon to the diagnosis as possible because we know treating curves at a smaller level, they're less structural, meaning as they get bigger, they get stiffer and they get more structural. So if we can treat them while they're smaller and less structural, we get a much more uh, significant result. And this allows us to be proactive in, in preventing progression. While we always can't guarantee how much a curve is gonna progress, we do know treating small curves or more, you're much more likely to ever have a severe curve if you treat it while it's small. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.